Well, hello again, everybody. We're going to talk here about the bradyarrhythmias, and uh, this is fairly high yield for your exam. Um, you do commonly get EKG rhythms that are sent to you, and you'll need to know um, what you're looking at. That is very, very common, uh, especially on step two and three. So very important stuff here. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel. You'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. All right, so we're gonna talk about bradyarrhythmias here and I have a number of other videos on other arrhythmias. Um, by the way, if you uh, haven't acquainted yourself with the EKG, you should do that because I'm going to assume you have some idea of normal. Okay, so bradycardia is just a heart rate of less than 60. Is that always abnormal? No. As you probably know, very well-trained athletes, they've got strong hearts. Those hearts can pump more per beat. And as a consequence, they don't need to beat as much to maintain the cardiac output that they need. Okay, so remember cardiac output, heart rate times stroke volume. If the stroke volume is higher, then the heart rate can be lower. The most important factor to note is whether the patient is stable. So how is their blood pressure? Are they, uh, are they hypotensive? If they're hypotensive, many cases, they will have things like syncope and loss of consciousness. So if you have a patient coming in uh, who's had an acute loss of consciousness or they're feeling faint all the time, you gotta get an EKG. Any patient who's experiencing acute symptoms should receive therapy, and the mainstay of therapy for symptomatic bradycardia is atropine and or external or internal pacing. Now, do we give atropine to everyone who's symptomatically bradycardic? No. Okay, we'll talk about the exceptions to that. All right, this is going to be what we're going to talk about. I just want to point out that the bundle branch blocks, they do not always cause bradycardia. In many instances, they don't, but they can, so I did include it here, uh, but I just want to highlight that. All right, so sinus bradycardia, all it is is it's a slow heart, okay? Like I said, it can be normal or maybe not, but it is a slow heart, that is it. The EKG will otherwise be normal. You'll have a normal PR interval. You'll have normal QRS complexes. Everything is fine, it's just a slow heart. There are a number of things that can cause that. Um, so hypothyroidism is one. If you're dealing with a younger person, uh, medications can do it. Uh, so if this is present, there may or may not be symptoms, but if there are, it's going to be symptoms related to hypoperfusion because the cardiac output is down. So look for things like dizziness, syncope, lightheadedness, fainting, and stuff like that. Uh, this is kind of, we already talked about this, best initial diagnostic step is EKG, but you're not going to have a patient coming in and saying, doc, my heart is slow. What you're going to have is a patient who comes in with a loss of consciousness. You're going to get your EKG, and then you're going to find out that they have bradycardia. So we're kind of working the other way around here. But if for whatever reason you've got a patient who lost consciousness, they're in the clinic, and you listen to their heart and it's slow, get an EKG. Uh, if there are symptoms with a, a sinus bradycardia, it's going to be atropine until resolution. If, that's re if it's refractory to that, then we start thinking about pacemaker, transcutaneous, or surgically implanted. But these patients will be referred to cardiology for that. So remember your formula, 300 divided by the number of big boxes between QRS complexes. So uh, what we see here, we got one, two, three, four, five, five and a half. So what's 300 divided by five and a half? I don't know exactly, but 300 divided by five is 60. Anything below that is going to be bradycardia. So if you have more than five big boxes between QRS complexes, um, then you're dealing with a bradycardia. But everything else here is pretty much normal. Okay, so AV block. This is a conduction disorder due to interruption within the AV conduction system. So between the atria and the ventricles. It could be at the AV node, it could be a little bit distal to that, uh, but it is uh, between the atria and the ventricles. Um, so um, remember, we have our SA node, that's gonna conduct through the atria. Then we have the AV node, and then that goes to the bundle of Hiss, which then splits into the right bundle and the left bundle. This problem is usually up here, or maybe down here. 
Um, so there, uh, we divided into four different types, first degree, two second degrees, and a third degree. Yes, they do tend to be more severe, more likely to be symptomatic, more in need of immediate treatment uh, as they uh, progress. Well, I shouldn't say progress, uh, as they go up in degree. Um, so they're not always going to progress from one to the other. Certainly, uh, type 2 can progress to third degree, uh, but there are a lot of people who have a first degree AV block, and they'll never know it. They'll never have symptoms. You'll only find it incidentally. That's going to be most of them, actually, um, whereas uh, a third degree block, um, that's pretty likely to cause symptoms. So the causes are variable. Uh, again, the symptoms here are going to relate to hypoperfusion if they are bradycardic. This is the conduction system. Uh, I just want to point out here, um, take a look at where your SA and AV nodes are and uh, these pathways here. Where are they? They're kind of along the right side of the heart. What vessel perfuses this area? The right coronary artery. So let's say I were uh, to ask you, uh, a patient experienced an MI, and now they have this rhythm, and I show you uh, a rhythm that's consistent with an AV block what type of MI did they have or what vessel uh, is most likely to have an occlusion? And it would be the right coronary artery. And what type of MI would that cause? A posterior wall MI, because the right coronary artery goes there. Okay, so these are the four we'll talk about. Um, we already talked about this. Uh, so um, this is a first degree AV block. Um, so this isn't exactly right here. Um, so what we're looking at here is from the P wave to the QRS complex. Now remember that the normal PR interval is 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds. You can also see it written as 120 to 200 milliseconds, same thing. So what is a big box, by the way? Big box is 0 0.2 seconds. So that's nice because what that tells us is if the PR interval is more than one big box, then it's prolonged, okay? Now, a first degree AV block is just PR prolongation. That is it, okay? There is nothing else abnormal. You will, in many instances, have a bradycardia, uh, but it's just PR prolongation. That's it, okay? And that's why this doesn't tend to cause symptoms, Okay, you can see the, this patient here isn't even bradycardic, but they do have a prolonged PR interval, so we will consider this a first-degree AV block. And now this patient clearly is uh, bradycardic. If you look here, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and a half. Um, so we're talking here a heart rate in the 40s. Okay, this is a second-degree AV block. Um, there are two types, Mobitz 1 and Mobitz 2. Mobitz 1 is also called Wanky Bach. Um, so what is classic for this, and many students just remember this one because it's got such a classic presentation, is that your PR interval, uh, it can start normal. So here, we're less than one big box. Here, we're roughly a big box. Here, we're longer, and then all of a sudden, drop. So this is how it happens. The PR interval, it gets longer and longer and longer, and then you drop, and then it starts up again. It's longer and longer and longer, and then it stops. So the PR interval varies, okay? It gets longer, and then you have a stop. So these patients are classically, uh, in most instances, what you'll appreciate is regularly irregular, meaning you'll have beat, 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 stop beat, 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 stop, or maybe beat, 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 stop. Um, it's it's uh, predictable, so it's regularly irregular. It's irregular, but it's predictably irregular, if you will. So again, you see it here, this prolongation, it's getting longer and longer, and then you drop, okay? Um, now, this is a Mobitz type 2. What you see here is the PR interval is normal. Um, so this is kind of a black sheep, but then you have this drop, okay? So the difference is uh, that you don't have that progressive prolongation, but you still have the drop, okay? That's pretty much it. So again, you see it here. Notice your PR interval is normal, but you've got this drop here. So you got this P wave, but no corresponding QRS complex, okay? 
Now, a third degree AV block, you have no association between the P wave and the QRS complex. You have them, but there's no association. So here is a P wave here. And it looks like we might have one here. It's kind of hard to tell since they're random. They can kind of uh, uh, merge into other complexes. You got one here and here and here and here. And here you can see what I'm talking about that merges into the T wave. Well, where are our QRS complexes? Here, here, here. So you can see there's no association. And that's exactly what's happening here. You've lost all your synchronization between the atria and the ventricles. And that's a big problem because if, what you need to have is a contraction of the ventricles after contraction of the atria because we want the ventricles to contract when they have blood. Um, so if you're, uh, let's say right here, for instance, uh, well, you had your pump here and then nothing, and then you have your uh, pumping of the ventricle. Well, maybe there's blood there, but then, um, uh, for instance, right here, you might not have as much blood. So you've got to have that nice, um, that nice uh, uh, coordination between the pumping of the atrium, pumping of the ventricles. Otherwise, um, it can diminish your cardiac output. Okay, so again, you see it here, just this no association. All right, now these patients, if they are unstable, uh, then we need to do something. So if it's Mobitz type one or Wenke-Bach, we can do atropine. However, if it's Mobitz type two or third degree, atropine is not going to be useful. So we go right to transcutaneous pacing and then we send them off for a permanent pacemaker. These patients will be referred to cardiology. Um, if they're stable, then the best initial step in management is to discontinue any drugs that block the AV node or to work up for the underlying cause. So if they are on drugs, the most common drugs are adenosine, not a common outpatient drug, but some common ones, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and digoxin, very common drugs. Um, so those are ones to look out for. Also look out for maybe the patient took too much. Maybe they've got too high of a dose. So uh, you should know if you need to reverse them, beta blockers, you would use glucagon, calcium channel blockers, calcium, and digoxin, we have antibodies against digoxin. Um, when is a pacemaker indicated? Any AV block with persistent severe symptoms or Mobitz type two and third degree uh, in the absence of any cause that's reversible. And in most instances, this is going to not be reversible. So this is just to get back um, to the AV blocks. We already talked about all this. Okay, now the bundle branch blocks are usually a symptom, not a disease. Um, so these are rarely symptomatic, but a lot of times they will reflect something um, going on. Um, we'll see um, there are different etiologies. Um, so remember, again here, you have your uh, SA node going to your AV node and then that bundle of Hiss, and then we have our right bundle and our left bundle. So what's happening here is you have a block on one of the bundles, and that is going to cause the right ventricle and left ventricle to not depolarize at the same time. They'll still both depolarize usually, uh, but they're not going to depolarize at the same time because you have a block slowing one of the bundles down. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll get to how that manifests and you'll see the QRS complexes are pretty um, abnormal looking. So a right bundle branch block is usually idiopathic, uh, but uh, can be caused by COPD. That is a big one. You'll want to remember that. It can also be caused by heart disease as well. Now on EKG, we get this very classic RSR pattern and it's going to be on, as you can imagine, the right-sided precordial lead. So V1 to V3. Okay, so let's take a look at these uh, right bundle branch blocks. Um, so this is where I want to draw your attention here. Remember, like I said, uh, because we're dealing with the right side, you're gonna be on the more right-sided precordial lead, so V1, V2. Um, now, a normal V1 should look something like that, okay? What you're seeing here is that you're coming up. Now, what's going on here? This R here and this R here, they both represent ventricular depolarizations. But remember, we have a right bundle branch block. So the 
right ventricular depolarization is going to be delayed. So you have two R's. You have one for the left and one for the right here. And that's just because of the delay. That's it. Now, another thing you can see if you look at V6 is you can see this slurred um, S wave. Uh, but I would really stick to looking at this RSR complex. It is classic for right bundle branch block. So again here, you can see this sort of M shape. And that is not what it should look like. It should look something more like that. Okay, now a left bundle branch block is um, usually caused by some sort of an some sort of intrinsic heart disease. Um, so hypertension, valvular disease, cardiomyopathies. Um, what you're going to see here is uh, something quite a bit different. Um, so here, what really is going to stand out is on V5 and V6, you'll see this notched uh, wave. So let's just get to looking at that here. Um, so, okay, so here we have V6, and what you can see here is this notching. And this is, again, it's the same thing going on here. It's the left and right uh, ventricles depolarizing at different times. Because, you know, normally we would have something like that, and you only see one uh, R. Well, here we have two. Um, so you see this notching. Sometimes it can be very, very discreet, and sometimes all it looks like is a wide QRS complex. Uh, but look for that notching in V5 and V6. That is a left bundle branch block. Now, another thing that we can see in the V1 is we can see this really, really, really dramatically low S wave. So remember, with V1, we should be something like that. Well, what you can see here is that we don't even really have that, uh, that R wave. We can barely see it. What we see is just this drop like that. And that is um, classic with left bundle branch block. But again, uh, look at V5 and V6. You'll see that notching. That is a giveaway for a left bundle branch block. And so again here, look at that deep S wave on V1 and V2, and then the notching in V5 and V6. You can see it a little bit more close up there. You can see that notching.